Well, good morning. How y'all doing? Morning. We uh, sure appreciate you folks on the internet. Make this ministry at least seem somewhat worthwhile. We, we are happy that you tune in with us. We're studying the book of Job, and as I kill a little bit of time here, you can turn to Job chapter 4, verse 12, and as we get ready to get started, but um, I just want you all to know that we appreciate uh, everybody that comes and everybody that tunes in, I can tell you this, um, it's appreciated and it's, a, and it's an encouragement. And so uh, you folks on the internet, God bless y'all. We ask that if you like our ministry here, that you subscribe if you're on YouTube, that you follow us if you're on Facebook. And then if you uh, like the message, hit that like button. That really helps us out more than you think. And uh, also, if it's a message that you think somebody could use, share it with them for crying out loud. And, and um, with all that being said, you know, it's, it's, uh, the title of the message is The Time to Just Shut Up. <laughs> and, and uh, of course, my wife absolutely hates the title because I remember uh, years and years ago when we first <laughs> got married, we were having some kind of a discussion. It wasn't an argument. Her and I very, very seldom have any arguments, but we were just having a discussion and she said something. I said, well, shut up. And she looked like I just slugged her in the face. And I'm like, "What? what's wrong? Well, you, you told me to shut up. So what's, what's wrong with saying shut up? And she goes, no, shut up is mean. And I said, no, shut up is the same thing as please be quiet. It's just a little more direct. Uh, I lost that argument, by the way. Um, and so anyway, the, the title of the message, uh, if you don't like the term shut up, you can change it in your mind towards the time to close your mouth. <laughs> is that better? <laughs> and uh, my wife shaking her head, yes, yes, that's better. But there's a time when we just need to shut up as we're going to see it. And um, would to God that we could learn that lesson. But boy, we don't seem to. And, and as I'm preaching this, you know, I've said this before. If, if somebody feels like they're getting taken to the woodshed, bear in mind, I got taken there before you did. And, and I'm guilty. There's times when I should just shut up and I don't. I just keep going. And usually it winds up when, when you do that, it's you're probably in your flesh and it winds up being... Uh, a mess. So we're in Job chapter four. By now, you've probably had a chance to get there. Let's look at verse 12. It says, now a thing was secretly brought to me and my ear received a little thereof. Now that's an important part because if you remember when uh, we started Job chapter uh, four, I made the comment that Eliphaz got a message. Uh, he's implying he got a message from God. Right here is where you're seeing that impl implication that he's saying, you know, I received it. A message was brought to me and my ear received a little thereof. Well, hopefully if we're getting a message from God, our ear receives a lot thereof and not a little thereof. Amen. Verse 13, it says, In thoughts from the vision of the night, when deep sleep falleth on man, fear came upon me and trembling, which made all my bones to shake. Then a spirit passed before my face. The hair of my flesh stood up. It stood still, but I could not discern the form thereof. An image was before mine eyes. There was silence, and I heard a voice saying, Shall mortal man be more just than God? Shall a man be more pure than his maker? Behold, he put no trust in his servants, and his angels he charged with folly. How much less then... How, how much less in them that dwell in houses of clay, whose foundation is in the dust, which are crushed before the moth. They are destroyed from morning to evening. They perish forever without any regarding it. Doth not their excellency, which is in them, go away? They die even without wisdom. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Lord, we do thank you for this day. We thank you for this message. We pray you, Lord, that um, it would be you that teaches that I can't get these ideas across no matter how hard I try. I, um, you know my heart. I, I pray that if there's any unconfessed sin in my life, you'd forgive it, that you could use me as a vessel to teach your word. And God, that it be effective and effectual and that uh, people would 
soften their hearts and, and unstop their ears and unblock their eyes that they can see and perceive and understand. And Lord, we just pray that we grow closer to you and have a greater love for your word as we go forward from this message, Lord. And we praise you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So uh, I don't know, you know, that just came to me. It's not part of my notes, but verse 14, it says, fear came upon me and trembling, which made all my bones to shake. Now, I'm pretty sure pretty much everybody, maybe not, but pretty much everybody has woken up in the middle of the night sometime and they just had a fear. <laughs> they didn't necessarily have a bad dream, but just something didn't seem right. Something was, and, and I think when that happens, and this isn't part of the message, it's free of charge. I'm not going to charge you anything extra for it. You know, the Bible says, be not afraid of sudden fear. And so when something like that happens, a smart approach is just to say, Lord, if there's any evil entity in this room, please take them away and protect me. Boom. And usually that fear dissipates. Maybe not the very second you pray it, but within just a few short seconds after that prayer, you'll have peace again. And um, the, the, one of the things that people seem to always lose track of, and this, the weird part about it is Christians lose track of the fact that we're in a spiritual battle. Yeah. And if you're trying to live for the Lord Jesus Christ, Satan doesn't like it. His minions don't like it. And so uh, they're going to do things to throw you off guard. They're going to do things to make you quit. And don't ever quit. Don't ever quit. Uh, I can honestly say, and I'm not complaining, it's just a statement of fact, um, since we've come to Alamosa, Colorado, we've probably had every obstacle thrown our way. And, and I'm not encouraging God to say, well, no, you haven't had everything. Here's a few more, you know, but, but we've had numerous obstacles thrown our way. And by the grace of God, not by my own power or the power of my flesh or anything, but by the grace of God, we've kept going. We've kept going and we will keep going until uh, God gives us orders to do something else. And I just don't feel like that's coming anytime soon. I, I truly have the feeling that Either we'll be raptured while I'm pastoring here in Alamosa, or I'll spend the rest of my days here in Alamosa. Now, I've never felt that way about any place that I've ever pastored or preached before, but I certainly feel that way about Alamosa, and I can't explain why, but it's okay with me. It's, if you're where God wants you to be, you can't be in any better place. Amen? Amen. So let's just kind of do a real quick review. I don't like to... Um, I have gotten comments that I review too deeply, and but I, I don't want to review too deeply, but you got to remember where we kind of left off in order for us to take off with where we're at this week. And last week, we looked at all those lions, and we saw a connection between them and the tribulation times. We, we compared and we looked at some of the tribulation books. We looked at Revelation. We looked at uh, some other things that compared all those lions, if you remember, uh, last week, and I'm not going to go back and read it again, but it talked about the young lion, the strong lion, the, um, it talked about all these lions. And going back to our text, we can conclude that Eliphaz had been visited by God because what he says lines up perfectly with both the Old Testament and the New Testament. What he's saying, what he's getting ready to say, um, it is not outside the realms of the Bible. And so when somebody says, and we talked about this briefly, when somebody says that they had a message from God, a visitation from God or uh, whatever, that an angel spoke to him or whatever. And listen, I, I, I said last week that it, within my camp, most people would just discard that saying it's not true. But the Bible says that be careful w when you're entertaining because some folks have entertained angels unaware. And so... To think that we're, we don't interact with angels is contrary to Scripture, and that's a New Testament um, context that we entertain angels unaware. And um, so, but how can you tell whether somebody has a lying spirit, a demonic spirit, or a spirit of God? Piece of cake. If it's a spirit of God, it's going to line up with this book. It's not going to deviate to the left, to the right, not even one iota. It's going to line up perfectly with this book. If it's uh, if the message in any way departs from this book, even that one iota, 
it's not from God. God is never going to con uh, contradict his word. He says, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. He said uh, it would be easier for the whole universe to disappear than for one jot or tittle of this book not be fulfilled. So God isn't changing his mind. And modern day Christians have this idea that, that okay, the, we got to change some of the stuff in the Bible because times have changed. <laughs> no, you don't change the Bible because times changed. Let me tell you something. Times have changed. They've changed for the worse. <laughs> And that's the, the history of mankind is everything gets worse over time until God shows some form of judgment that sets everything aright again. And we, when that happens, usually there's a change in dispensation. I talked about a message that was preached by a, a good preacher named um, Robert Breaker. Uh, the message was entitled, Every Dispensation Ends in Disaster. And that's a true statement. Every dispensation of the Bible, and the, the, for those of you that are nervous because I'm talking about dispensations, look it up in your Bible. Dispensation is a Bible word. It's a God word. God created dispensations, and um, Paul talks about he is the minister of the dispensation of grace, a new dispensation. The old dispensation ended in disaster. The Jews killed their Messiah. Yeah. Amen. Now, as prophesied, it was going to happen but it's still a disaster for the for the Jew. And um, now what's what's up with the Jew now? Well, according to the Bible, the Jew has blindness in part. They have a hard time with spiritual subjects. And listen, I'm not saying that because I think Jews are not smart. I think Jews are smart. As a matter of fact, they're the, that little teeny nation has done more for the advancement of technologies and more for the advancement of of any kind of industry or whatever, they are smart people, but they've been given some spiritual blindness and their soul um, kind of puts up a barrier against spiritual truth. And, and um, they need signs, they need wonders. I mean, the Bible says the Jew seeketh after a sign, or it doesn't say seeketh after, it says requires. The Jew requires a sign. And so in truth, when it, um, Eliphaz was talking, he should have just shut up when he got done with all this stuff of, of talking in Job uh, chapter 4. He should have ended right there. Matter of fact, he should not only have ended, but he should have given Job a great big hug. Just comfort him. Just give him a hug. Talk about the things that he talked about and stop right there because he'd already cut Job to the bone. You know, if you'll remember last week when we were looking at uh, the previous verses to today's text, he talked about the thing that you fear most is what's come upon you. You've got, you've got uh, um, this judgment and we know that God doesn't judge a righteous person. We know that God, and I'm paraphrasing obviously. So he should have just stopped at this point. He already said the piece that Job probably needed to hear because as we're going to find as we keep going that Job is guilty. I mean, he's not completely innocent. He's self-righteous. And um, how many Christians today do you suppose are guilty of self-righteousness? <laughs> so when we get to chapter 5, verses 1 through 4, we're going to see that Eliphaz classifies Job as foolish, as silly, and as a cursed sinner. He should have just stopped. <laughs> he should have just stopped and gave him a, 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 a hug. But as you stop and think about it, you know, you go and you find a brother who's down and going through some trouble, and then you tell him that they're foolish. What's foolishness? Well, the Bible says a fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So if you take that definition of a fool and you apply foolishness, foolishness is somebody who behaves as if there wasn't a God. And that's foolishness. And so Aliphaz classifies him as foolish. He classifies him as silly. And uh, my son's probably laughing because he says silly a lot, and I kind of tease him about it. And, and he, he, he classifies him as a cursed sinner. Now, truth be told, there's times when we're all foolish. <laughs> there's times when we're all silly, and there's times when we're all, and we are 
Uh, we've been saved by the blood of the crucified one. Amen. Amen. But prior to that, we were cursed sinners, no matter how good our life was. And so you look at those things that Eliphaz accuses Job of or, or classifies Job as, you got to scratch your head a little bit and say, some comfort, huh? Because... <laughs> And he's the one that's classified as the comforter by all the scholars of the three friends that come to visit Job. Aliphaz is the mildest one that they say is the comforter. And what kind of comfort is it when somebody comes to you and says, you know, you're foolish, you're silly, and you're a cursed sinner. <laughs> that's a lot of comfort, amen. So let's point out some similarities to this in some other portions of scripture. Let's just, let's do some comparison and, and uh, we're going to get into a point where we're going to talk about the times of Job's trouble. And uh, that's important, the times of Job's trouble, because you, you see, we're going to get to a time of Job's trouble. And I keep telling you, this book is, is a, a picture and type of the tribulation. And what is the tribulation? The time of Jacob's trouble. And so we're going to see that, but let's compare some verses. Verse 13 says, In the thoughts from the vision of the night when deep sleep falleth, upon, falleth on man. Uh, keep your fingers here because we're going to be coming back. But turn to Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15 and verse 12. Genesis 15, 12. And you get to the front of your Bible and the whole book wants to turn the page, right? Genesis 15, verse 12 says, uh, And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abraham, or Abram, this is before he was Abraham. A deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. This is where God's getting ready to reveal some stuff to Abraham, and uh, Abram at the time. But, you know, the sun goes down, he falls asleep, and uh, he gets in this deep sleep and he's having visions and, and thoughts. Hmm, some comparison. And remember, we're dealing with tribulation material. I'm gonna keep saying that over and over because people don't seem to think about that, but we're dealing with tribulation uh, material. So back to our text in verse 15, it says, the spirit passed before my face and the spirit, uh, then a spirit passed before my face. Uh, the hair of my flesh stood up. And uh, I think that sometimes we will have the, you know, and, and it's a common saying, boy, the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. And you know what also happens when that happens? The hairs on your arms stand up. And, and um, I think that oftentimes there might be something spiritual, especially if there's no reason for it. I mean, your hairs are going to stand up when you get cold because you get those goose pimples and then goose pimples make the hair stand up. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about something spiritual and your, and your body can sense it and the hair stand up and something's about ready to take place. And so this spirit, um, angels are defined uh, by the Bible as ministering spirits. Um, you can turn there if you want to. You certainly don't have to, but that's in Hebrews 1.14. And so this spirit is more than likely an angel because the Bible defines angels as ministering spirits. And so you have some scholars that take Hebrews 1.14 and they apply it. Apply it um, they, they, and actually, they kind of ignore it because most scholars will tell you that angels are messengers. And while it's true that angels can be messengers, that's not an absolute. Uh, there's sections in the Bible where angels have come just to witness something. And I'm sure that they're witnessing something in order to uh, give judgment. When God gives judgment, they're gonna be witnesses to something that they came and witnessed. And so sometimes they're witnesses. Sometimes they're, they're not messengers, they're fighters. I mean, they're, you know, they, they come to, what about the angel that wiped out 180, some thousand men in one night, boom. That's a five, there wasn't no message there. There wasn't no, hey, y'all repent or I'm gonna wipe you out. No, he just came and wiped them out, amen. And so, uh, but the Bible does in Hebrews 1, 14 refer to angels as ministering spirits. And so this spirit passed before his face 
And I find it kind of interesting in verse 16, that spirit stood still, but he could not discern the form thereof. That's interesting. That's interesting because there's a lot of people that talk about things that they've seen where they could tell something was there, but they couldn't really tell what it was. And, and um, a lot of people just poo-poo a lot of that. I mean, if you watch any documentaries on UFOs or Bigfoot and you can say, hey, preacher, none of those things exist. Whatever, I'm not going to argue that they do exist. The, the reality is, is that if you listen to some of those descriptions that people say and you compare it with something like this, you say, man, that's, there's some similarities there. And there is a spiritual battle going on. The spirit world is more real than the world that we live in. So this spirit must be one of those angels because his of because he has a form and an image, even though he couldn't make it out. I could not discern the form thereof. That's implying there was a form, but he couldn't discern it. Amen. Amen. And probably it's a different dimension than what humans live in, but he couldn't discern it. So this angel's short sermon is aimed at those who are made a little lower than the angels. <laughs> His message is aimed at those that are created from the dust, those that dwell in houses of clay. Look at verse 19, how much less than them that dwell in houses of clay. You know, man is made a little lower than the angels. Man is, is the, a man is, Man thinks that they're the end of all. They think that they're the, they're the cat's meow. They think that we are the special of all creation. And we're a little lower than the angels. We're probably the, the other than animals, we're probably the lowest of creation. So they're cursed before the moth in verse 19. It says, how much less them that dwell in houses of clay, that's humanity, whose foundation is the dust, God made man, formed man out of the dust of the ground. Amen. Amen. And are, which are crushed before the moth. Uh, wow. Crushed before the moth. Look at Job 27, 18. Hold your fingers. Always hold your fingers here because we're going to be coming back quite a bit. So Job, Job 27 and verse 18. It says, uh, uh, Job 27, 18 says, uh, he buildeth his house as a moth and as a booth that the keeper maketh. What's his connection to moths and, and, and man? And, and uh, the idea is that, well, before we do that, let's look at Psalm 39, 11. Let's once again, keep your hand here. Psalm 39, 11. Psalm 39, 11. It says, when thou with rebukes does correct man for iniquity, thou makest his beauty to consume away like a moth. Surely every man is vanity, Selah. Selah just means like amen, so be it. Uh, stop and think about what was just said. And so God's making this comparison to man and to moths. The idea is that we humans rot away like a piece of old cloth that a moth is chewed on. <laughs> if you've ever uh, gotten, you know, uh, we would like to, have, well, I'm not going to say we would like to have more, but we don't have enough closet space for all of our clothes. So every spring, my wife puts some of the winter clothes away and brings out some of the spring and summer clothes. And in, in fall, she puts away the spring and summer clothes and brings out the winter clothes and we've been blessed we haven't had destruction by moth but why do you think there was a creation of mothballs back in the day before you could really seal things up because when people would do that when they put away their um spring and winter their spring and summer clothes and bring out their fall and winter clothes and they pull out a sweater and have holes all over it where the moths have eaten it so look at isaiah 51 and verse 6 isaiah 51 6 Now, whether you recognize it or not, this is good stuff. 51.6 says, Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look upon the earth beneath. For the heavens shall vanish away like smoke, and the earth shall wax old like a garment. Huh. 
moths, garment. And they that dwell therein shall die in like manner, but my salvation shall be forever and my righteousness shall not be abolished. There's something there, folks. There's something there. And you say, well, give us the depths of it. No. <laughs> I'm giving you a 30,000 foot view. And if you want to dig into it more, you can just look up moth. You can look up um, garments. You can look all that stuff up and you can run it out of yourself. So uh, verse 20 of our text back in Job 4 says, uh, they are destroyed from morning to evening. They perish forever without any regarding it. They die like flies. I mean, if you stop and think about this, they die like moths. You, you know, one thing when, when it's moth season and this church is a log cabin and, and um, there's gaps between, it's an old log cabin. It was built in the sixties. So, so it's an old log cabin. And ever since we've lived here, it's, this is, we're coming up on our fourth anniversary, believe it or not. But ever since we've lived here, we've been working at patching some of the gaps between the logs. And we're, it, it's coming along. I'm not complaining about it. But when it's moth season, we can come into church and find moths everywhere. And you know what? They, they die without anybody regarding it. You, you come in and you'll see 100 dead moths on the floor. And you go, man, where in the world did all those moths come from? But they die like moths. They die like flies and if you stop and think about it hundreds upon hundreds now really thousands upon thousands of people die every day night and day there's no time for rest for the death angel if you will men die constantly and, and sometimes they die with loved ones and people have an empty space because they lost a loved one but there's hundreds if not thousands that die without anybody Nobody regarding it. Nobody putting any consideration to it. If you go into the big city, there's almost always some John Doe's or Jane Doe's in the morgue that, that, and oftentimes they were street people. They were homeless. They didn't have anybody in their life. And they normally, they get taken care of without anybody attending any kind of a wake or a funeral or anything like that. So then it comes to verse down to verse 21. First of all, they, they die without anybody regarding it. They die from morning to evening. It doesn't matter. And then verse 21, doth not their excellency, which is in them, go away. Huh. Excellency must be a, and, and I'm, this is opinion. This is this. I, I'm not going to be able to confirm this with Bible. So take it with a grain of salt, but Excellency must be a self uh, thought of, a self proclaimed thing within man because excellency really doesn't go away. I mean, the Lord Jesus Christ is excellent, amen? amen. His excellency is true excellency and it's never going to fade. It's never going away. But the excellency of man, that's going to go away. And probably it's connected with verse 20 when they die with nobody regarding it. And listen, even if somebody is greatly loved in this world, you know, sometimes you'll go by a funeral pro, uh, profession, progression and there'll be hundreds of cars following that hearse. And you go, man, that guy was popular. How many of those people could even give that dead person a thought five, 10 years after they've been dead? <laughs> Their excellency goes away. The, the, the love of them goes away. And um, you say, well, what about some of the <clears throat> folks in history like George Washington, Martin Luther King Jr. And you can name all kinds of folks that are supposedly heroes that had excellency in their youth. But if you really, if you really dig and find out who that person was and what they portray him as of today, it's not the same. It's not that's they're not the person. They they can't live up to what history has puff them up to be and you got to ask yourself why would history puff them up there's got to be an agenda there man's excellency goeth away and um so their excellency goeth away now let's compare some verses with that i said we're going to compare scriptures amen keep your hands here look at psalm 49 verse 12 psalm 49 and verse 12 
Psalm 49, verse 12, it says, Nevertheless, man being in honor abideth not. He is like the beast that perish. <laughs> Isn't that something? You know, you might have a pet that you love dearly and they die and you bury them. And, and, uh, but do you give them much thought after a couple of years? Now, I've had some, I'm a dog guy. I've had some dogs that I've loved dearly. The best dog we ever had was Sugar, right? Mm -hmm. She was a sweetheart. She died probably two years ago, but we still talk about, boy, she was the best dog we ever had. We got some good dogs now. I'm not complaining about them. But you just read in verse 12, verse 12, it says, uh, Nevertheless, man being in honor abideth not. He is like the beast that perish. Drop down to verse 16. Verse 16. It says, Be not thou afraid when one is made rich, when the glory of his house is increased. For when he dieth, he shall carry nothing away. His glory shall not descend after him. Though while he lived, he blessed his soul, and man will praise thee when thou doest well to thyself. He shall go to the generation of his fathers. They shall never see light. Man that is in honor and understandeth not is like the beast that perish. We think we're something, and we're really, we're really not. We're really not. So, uh, um, turn back to Job 4.21. It says they die even without wisdom. Uh, the contrast, of course, is that man thinks he's wise. Man thinks that we're the, like I said, we think we're the end all of everything. We think, you know, we try and confine God to what we think, you know. I don't believe God would. Well, it doesn't, if God would, it doesn't matter what you believe. You, you think you're wise and, and you're going to die without wisdom, according to the Bible. Man thinks he has all the answers. If it weren't for the Bible, folks, I wouldn't have a single answer to anything. The Amen. Bible is what gives me my authority. The Bible is what gives me the answer to any spiritual question and any any inkling of wisdom that I have towards God, towards even towards the Bible itself. You know how I came to the conclusion that the King James Bible is the Word of God? The Bible. The Bible showed me that the King James Bible is the Word of God. And most of the folks that fight against that uh, spiritual truth, the folks that fight against they don't even read a Bible. They think they're wise. They think that they're brilliant. You know, they're the check out the big brain on Brad, you know, and really uh, you're going to die even without wisdom. Whatever wisdom you can have comes from God. Whatever wisdom God is going to give to you depends on your heart and how you're willing to follow him and how much time you spend in his word. He tells you to search as if you're searching for treasures. Search those scriptures, do you? Man is full of himself. But just like it said back in Psalm 49, verse 20, we're not going to turn back there again. Man's, men are like the beast that perish. God looks at man and all of his wisdom. Think of the wisest person you think ever walked the face of the earth and God looks down at him and uh, knows nothing. He has no wisdom. He's full of himself. God certainly revealed that truth to Solomon. <laughs> Solomon, who the Bible says is the wisest man that ever lived, short of the Lord Jesus Christ, but the Lord Jesus Christ was God. But it says in Ecclesiastes 3.18, Solomon made an observation. He said, for that which befalleth the son of man befalleth beasts. Even one thing befalleth them. As the one dieth, so dieth the other. Yea, they have all one breath, so that a man hath no preeminence above a beast, for it's all vanity. So here's the wisest guy that ever lived. And he said, man, what do we offer to this creation of God? What, do, what special thing do we? We're no better than a, than a dog. We're no better than a cow. We're no better than a beast. We're going to die just like those beasts die. And we're going to have, most humans are going to have very little impact on this world. 
So you read something like that. I always think of Dr. Gene Kim. I love him. You know what he'd say? How about that? <laughs> How about that? He says that all the time. I love it. How about that? Man thinks he's the beginning and the end of all things. Solomon's conclusion is found in verse 20. All go into one place. All are of the dust and all turn to dust again. Wow. We backtrack just slightly and look at, let's, let's backtrack. Let's look at Job chapter four and let's look at verse uh, 17. It says, shall mortal man be more just than God? What it is asking in the true sense of the word is can such a feeble, fickle, frail, fragile, fluttering, fallible speck in the wind be more pure than his maker? No, you can't. You're not going to be better than God. You're, you're not going to be able. There's people on this earth that accuse God all the time. They make accusations about God. I, I, the one liberal piece of work said, if there is a such thing as God, and if there is a such thing as heaven, I'm not going to even pause. I'm going to walk right in because I deserve it. No, you don't. You deserve hell. And you, you can make all these accusations about God on this earth. You can say that he's evil. You can say that he's mean. You can say, how could a loving God do this, that, or the other? But the truth of the matter is when you see God and everybody's going to see him because everybody's going to be judged by him. When you see him, all those arguments, all those discussions, all those thoughts, all those contemplations are just going to melt. <laughs> you know what people said when they saw God? They said, uh, uh, depart from me, Lord, because I'm an unclean man that, with unclean lips that dwell among a people of unclean men and unclean lips. Because his righteousness is so significant that there's no way that we can measure up. Shall mortal man be more just than God? No. Shall a man be more pure than his maker? No. You're wicked. And part of your wickedness is you don't even see your wickedness. We're all wicked. The Bible says the heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? So let's look at verse 18. Behold, he put no trust in his servants. God. God puts no trust in his servants. Now, I'm going to blow your mind with that statement. Behold, he, who's he? God, put no trust in his servants and his angels he charged with folly. Wow. Wow. This is the first uh, real reference, and, and we're going to take a side, we're going to come back to this, but we're going to take a side step because this is the first real reference which indicates the times of Job's trouble. What do you mean? Well, let's look. Look at, keep your hand here. Look at Job chapter 9 and verse 8. Job chapter 9 and verse 8. It says, Which alone spreadeth are out the heavens and treadeth upon the waves of the sea. That's God. God alone spreads the heavens out. He alone uh, treadeth upon the waves of the sea. You know, when I read verses like that, I think of Jesus walking on the water. Mm-hmm. There's magicians that want you to think they're as good as Jesus. There's magicians that do uh, acts where they walk on the water. It's false. There's a trick behind it. And it doesn't matter whether I can figure the trick out or not. There's a trick behind it. They, are, they do not have the ability to walk on the water. Turn over to Job uh, 15 and verse 19. Job 15 and verse 19. Job 15 and verse 19. Unto whom alone the earth was given, and no stranger passed among them. Um, it, who's them? Well, look at verse 17. I will show thee, hear me, and that which I have seen I will declare, which wise men have told from their fathers and have not hid it. Unto whom alone the earth was given, and no stranger passed among them. Look at you say, I'm not getting it yet, preacher. Just hang on. Let's follow this thing out. Look at 21, verse 12. Job 21, verse 12. 
verse 21, verse 12. Uh, they take the trim timbrel and harp and rejoice at the sound of the organ. Man is man's looking for excitement. Man's looking for, but Job is in trouble. Amen. And the world thinks that things are going to get better. Turn over to the next chapter, Job chapter twenty-two, and look at verses fifteen and sixteen. Verses fifteen and sixteen. Hast thou marked the old way which wicked men have trodden? Uh oh. <laughs> which were cut down out of time, whose foundation was overflown with a flood. Now we connect the old time with the flood, judgment, judgment, Job's trouble, Jacob's trouble, everything. The Bible says that men are going to be saying, peace, peace, safety, 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 peace and safety. The government's going to take care of me. I'm going to be okay. I don't have to worry about things. And then comes sudden destruction job's troubles job can talk about prosperity job can talk about the good god job can talk about how god gave this thing to men but god didn't just turn man loose and say i'm done with it <laughs> every dispensation has ended in disaster every dispensation god is such a merciful god every dispensation has ended in disaster, and at the end of every dispensation, God says, we'll start new. We'll start afresh. We're going to give man another chance. <laughs> We're going to give them a, a, another dispensation. We're going to give them the opportunity to come to me because he's long-suffering. He wants his creation to love him by their choice, not by his dictate. Um, that's what's wrong with Calvinism. If if Calvinism is right, God gets no glory out of man turning to him because they had no choice but to turn to him. Uh, God gets no glory out of men perishing for not turning to him because they had no choice but to not turn to him. God gave us free will, and he gets glory out of us looking at our lives, examining ourselves, and saying, I'm a mess. <laughs> I'm doomed. I'm wicked. I have no, wait a second, I do have hope. God, God is my hope. Jesus is my savior. Jesus is my way out of this mess. Amen. He gets glory out of that. So eventually we're going to be, not necessarily in our study of Job, but eventually because we're talking about the doctrines of the Bible, and eventually we're going to talk about the doctrine of the gap. And the naysayers have tried to, discredit the gap by saying it's a gap theory. By comparing scripture with scripture, I don't see how you can conclude anything other than it's a gap fact. <laughs> Something happened between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. But to suffice it to say at this point, Job and his three friends are not the theme of Pharaoh and the Exodus because that's what some scholars want you to think. They're not the theme of the Tower of Babel and God confounding their languages, because that's what some scholars want you to think. They are the flood of the original creation. Noah's flood was not the first flood this world has experienced. And you say, well, preacher, I don't know where you get that. I get that from this book, and we, we don't have time to delve into that right now, and we're not going to delve into that right now. God knows what man is and what's within man. We studied that when we were doing our study on the book of John. It says that Jesus knew what was in man. God ne would never completely trust Moses. <laughs> He's a man. God knows man. He knows what's in man. He would never completely. Some folks, I don't know, probably some folks on the internet are shutting this off right now. God would never put 100% of his trust in David. He wouldn't put it in Jude, James, John, or Paul. Now, John was the apostle whom God loved, but he knows what's in man. Man is prone to do wrong. Yes. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to lead the God I love. God's not going to put his trust in any of his servants completely. You know how many times God's been let down by man? It's, it's sad, but it's true. 
you know that God places a warning right smack dab in the middle of your Bible. You get, and it's a significant warning. It's right smack dab in the middle of your Bible. In the fact, it is the exact middle of your Bible. It is the exact middle verse of the Bible. If you take all the verses of the Bible and divide it by two, this verse is smack dab in the middle of your Bible. Turn to Psalm 118, verse 8. Psalm 118, verse 8. How do you get there so fast? I don't have it up there. You must have been looking at my notes. Psalm 118, verse 8. That's the very middle verse of your Bible. It says, It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Amen. Right, exactly. The exact middle verse of your Bible says, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. I get accused all the time of, think, of people say, you think you know everything and that you're the only one that's right. Well, if that's the truth, how come I constantly say, do not put your faith in me? <laughs> when I line up with this book, I'm 100% right. If I don't line up with this book, I'm 100% wrong. I refuse to be your final authority. Put your faith in this book, which is the Lord. You say, well, wait a second. That's the Bible. It's not the Lord. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Amen. This, these, this paper and this leather bind, binding's not God, but these words are, these words are God. Put your faith in that. Put your final authority in that. When I teach something, carefully examine the scriptures to ensure that what I'm saying is true. When I say this is my opinion, I always say, take this with a grain of salt. This is my opinion. Why do I take that approach? Because it's better to put your faith in the Lord, your trust in the Lord, your confidence in the Lord than in man. I don't want anybody saying I believe that because Pastor Jeff said it. Don't want you to do that. So uh, we're going to leave off there for today. We're going to pick up. We're going to be back in Job 4.17 when we come back next week. But we're going to leave off there for today. And let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we do thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. God, we're thankful that there's something that we can put our trust in that's far superior to our intellects, far superior to our reasoning, far superior to to our spiritual well-being, Lord, and that's you and your word. And so God, help us to love it, help us to cherish it, help us to study it, help us to read it, help us to understand it. We love you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.